Hello and welcome to In the Light, Growing Your Soul with me, Anna Isabel, and my delightful guest today, who is Laura D. Pusey, who is a death practitioner. Welcome, Laura. Hi, Anna. How are you doing? <laughs> it's lovely to have you. <laughs> Excuse me. It's lovely to have you here. It's um, I, I do follow your work and I and I think what you do is hugely important, but takes a bit of explanation. Yes. So begin with what is a death practitioner? OK. All right. Well, in my search to define myself and all the work that I do, death practitioner was the 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 only thing really that I could think of that kind of encapsulates everything. So as a death practitioner or death care practitioner, I'm an end of life guide, which means that I can work with people who are facing the transition from life through to death. I work with individuals and their family members just to come to terms with what's happening. We work on a, an emotional, practical, social and spiritual level to ensure that, you know, all of their needs are met at that time and that their wishes as much as possible are fulfilled. So that's the end of life guidance. And then as I've known the person and built a relationship with them and their family members, I then go on to conduct the funeral ceremony if, if required. And uh, so as a funeral celebrant, I then work with them to create the funeral that is desired by them all and then ensure that the service goes well. And that's liaising with funeral directors and florists and everybody else. And then thirdly, I'm a grief um, therapist. So as a grief therapist, I then work with families, individuals, anybody who is experiencing grief from any trauma of the death transition and that I think at the moment is really where I'm sitting quite solidly in the grief area so yes that in all really is my role as a death practitioner. It's I think very beautiful and delicate work and I was just listening to you talking about the the celebrant part of your work yeah and I feel quite strongly that funerals are where the healing begins. Yes. You have the shock of the loss, which is intense. And, but somehow your, your mind is on all the funeral arrangements and actually the cruelty of the bureaucracy that surrounds death. Yes, yes. It, the, the, the amount of paperwork that you're having to deal with, which is absolutely cruel and absurd at a time when you're dealing with the loss of somebody you, you love. So there's all of that which keeps you busy. And then I, in my experience, grief doesn't probably kick in until after the funeral. That's yeah. when it begins to really hit home as well. And sometimes it's during the funeral. But if you have that way of not saying goodbye, but coming to terms with the reality of this physical loss, mm. then it sets things up. It makes it, I don't know, it doesn't make it easier because grief is never easy, but it kind of, there's a comfort there because it brings people together very often, hopefully. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and it just, uh, there's a softening of the, of the edges. It's, yeah. a, it's a comfort that's there. So I think what you do is, is hugely important on all levels. What do you feel as a celebrant is the core of making that funeral a healing experience oh there are so many levels to that question and also to what you've said as well and it's so true that the grief process begins at the funeral and so it's vital 
that we get that right and that we capture the personality, the character of the person who has passed away. And often when that's not, when that's not done in a way that satisfies our soul, it can add to our grief moving forward. Also, as you've said as well, that, you know, it is a time where there is so much bureaucracy, there is so much paperwork, and this is a time when we're also quite vulnerable as well. So we're at the mercy of people who do this work every day to the point where maybe their feelings are not as invested as ours are, which means that at this time we can agree to certain practices taking place that in hindsight we might not have wanted or we know that our loved one might not have wanted. So for me as a funeral celebrant, it's more than just ensuring that the eulogy is read and that the, the ceremony is, um, how do we put this, you know, kept to time, although that's very important. But it's also about speaking with the individuals involved and maybe also taking them apart away separately and asking them, tell me about mum. What did dad like? tell me working with them as a family as well and just bringing up those memories and those good times and you know the events that have happened in our lives that we need to get into that eulogy the eulogy and the service is a celebration from my culture from where I'm coming from death is to be celebrated it's a transition it's a leveling up and so it's not so much about the the misery of the fact that we have lost our loved one. In the traditional sense, it is often quite a somber time of grief and mourning, but we must remember that our loved ones lived and in living, they had experiences. They brought joy, they brought laughter and happiness. And so it's really about capturing those moments for the tears, but also for the laughter as well, so. I think it's, when I think about um, funerals that I've attended, which have not been many, thankfully, okay. uh, but also how I experience loss, yeah. there is this agonizing pain but one of the things that happens to me, and I know happens to many people, is that in the first 24 to 48 hours, I'm just flooded with memories. I just, and I just need to, to go through those memories. And it's, um, I think it's part of the processing. Absolutely. Because when you have a, a life that you have shared with someone, um, be it a parent, a friend, you know, a, a husband, a wife, it doesn't matter what the relationship is, but when it's a close relationship and suddenly that physical connection is severed, suddenly you have to put that into a context. Well, what did this relationship mean to me? Mm. And I think that that's why the memories flood in, because I think we are wanting to put that relationship into some sort of context and yeah. understand the meaning of it. Yeah. Because the actual <laughs> word we use to describe the relationship isn't enough. Husband, wife, mother, father, sister, it doesn't matter. That word, it only describes, it's almost like saying you are next to me or you're in front of me or you're behind me. You know, you're to my left, you're to my right. That's it, they're relational words. Yes. And what we want is we want to process the experience of that person being a part of us. And I'm always struck the nice thing. And I was, um, I was at um, a funeral only two weeks ago. Um, the nice thing is watching people 
come together and share memories. Yes. Remember this, do you remember that? Looking at photo albums, um, it's, that's the, it's very precious. So we could say that that's a celebration, mm. but it's, it's much more than that, isn't it? Yes, it's a lot deeper. And one thing that we don't realize is that when we're going through life with these people next to us, around us, you know, in our lives, we, we don't often realize just how deeply we love. And so when they do pass away, the depth of our grief almost goes underneath that love, you know, to sort of rise it and bring it to the fore. And it physically hurts. Every cell in our bodies is attuned to that person in a way that we were never consciously aware of. And so when they are gone, it can feel as if the rug has been pulled from beneath us. And we're not prepared. Nobody can tell us how we're going to feel at that time. We can, you know, we can imagine how we'd like to feel. But often we are just knocked for six when somebody passes away. So, yes, there will be feelings of shock and just memories coming to our minds. And those little things that they used to say or do. Their smell, their voice, just seeing them smile at us, you know, it's. It can be a really sobering time. But yes, the memories that we have keep us going and they, 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 they keep on coming. And again, this is our body's way of trying to heal and make sense of what's going on. Because on a conscious level, yeah, we know they've gone, they've passed away. But our heart yearns for our loved ones. And that's where we need to take time with ourselves and be gentle and honor those emotions that come to the fore mm. so it seems to me that the funeral has many functions there's the honoring of the the person who has passed and yes. and the honoring of their life which in in many traditions is a celebration of their life um, it's about beginning the process of healing and processing mm. for those who are left behind but you and I know this does not always run smoothly because yes. families are not always havens of, of peace. Yes. So yes. how do you, in your work with, you know, working with people who are dying and then as a celebrant, how do you deal with family dynamics when they are actually causing more pain, aggravating the, the pain of grief? This is such an interesting question <laughs> and one that I could speak on for hours, I think. So I'll try not to get passionate and run away with myself. You know, yes, I find that at this time, this is a time when a lot of families experience conflict. And this conflict can be over many things. It can be over financial matters now moving forward who's gonna pay for the funeral and everything that goes with it. But oftentimes as well, we find that what comes to the fore are previous traumas, pre previous grievances that were never dealt with, that were hushed up, that were swept under the carpet. They come up because now the answers are gone. They may never be dealt with. They may never get apologies. This may never, give them a point of closure. And so it can be quite a conflicting time. What's necessary for me is the need to speak to everybody and ensure every voice is heard. And so, yes, as a celebrant, I do the work of a celebrant, but it's often here that myself and many other celebrants will also say as well, that they do a lot of therapy at this time. People need to be heard and they need to feel as though they've been understood and that their feelings are valid. One thing that I find a lot as well is that people say, I'm, I'm crying and I shouldn't be crying. Why am I crying? And I say, because you're in your 50s and you knew your mother your whole life or your father. These are the very first people you ever loved. 
how can you just pick yourself up and carry on as if nothing has happened? This is natural. This is life. Emotions do run rampant and this can cause issues for other members of the family because each relationship is individual. A mother can have three daughters and have a completely different relationship with all three of them. And that is an experience that I myself had. And so throughout my experiences with dying, death and grief, I'm able to empathise with people and just recognise the importance of being held and heard during that time. You know, just facilitate that space so that people can express themselves without fear of judgment as well. Because again, you know, once the funeral is over, we find that that's the time when everybody scatters and everything goes quiet. And often it's then that we are left alone with our feelings. So it really is, I'm, I'm a great believer in talking. Talk, 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 talk it out, talk it to everybody. We all carry a level of grief within us. So we need to speak about it. I think in my experience, the familial issue that most commonly crops up at this point is sibling rivalry. Yeah. You know, there are sometimes, you know, issue, other issues, but the one that really seems to really pop up large and sadly frequently is sibling rivalry. So how do you deal with that? Because um, people can be very angry um, mm. and actually quite vindictive mm. um, at, at, at times like this. Yeah, I've spoken to somebody just this week, actually, who said, you know, it was at that point that my brother changed and he became a completely different person. And who he is now is not the person that I grew up with. It is often a time where bitterness comes to the fore. One way that I sort of work around that around the time of the transition and the funeral celebration or you know service is to appoint roles to the different siblings i don't suppose you could do this for me could you do that for me you know keep them busy and keep them apart as much as normal as as much as possible but then also just keep on checking in with everybody as well you know, sometimes there are situations where family members haven't spoken to each other for years. And yet they're here or, as in my case, they are not actually allowed to be anywhere near the service, near the loved one, near or even know where the loved one is being laid to rest. It really is a matter of, you know, seeking them out even if just for a one-to-one, -one, how are you doing? Talk to me, tell me about your parent. And then if the circumstance arises or time allows, what happened? Where did the breakdown come? Because this is actually a really important time where perhaps the conflict can be resolved. Regardless of how we feel for the person who's passed away, there's always going to be a level of feeling within us for that person. And if we can just find that one uniting thread that binds us all, we can work on that. So it is an interesting time. Yeah. It's, it's certainly um, difficult. You know, as a therapist, I, I call it complicated grief. You know, yes. Like it's um it's very fortunate if all that you have to deal with is the loss that's that's utterly excruciating yeah but it's simple you just miss your loved one there are no complications yes. and that's enough yeah but then when you have what i call complicated grief where it's unfinished business the things that were never said yes. the apology that were never made on either side. 
and then there's all the mm, all the additional conflict mm. that in that exists between family members you know it's never going to be fixed the person is gone never going to be fixed. it's final there is so that's that's it you know as far as you're concerned that's it now i have a different view on this but that is the experience that people have mm. is that the, that hope that one day i'd hear that apology or that i'd feel strong enough to go and and see them yes. that's gone. yes and that's absolutely gone in this sense so i love what you do i love what you do because it's it's like a, a a healing balm that begins to stimulate the possibility of um, of something better, a better future, mm -hmm. rather than a, a degenerating progression of depression. Yes, that turns into a crisis somewhere down the road or a health issue, etc. Yep, you know, I, <laughs> you're 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 touching on everything. <laughs> It's so true what you say. I often speak to people who have the privilege of being able to just mourn the loss of their loved one because everything else is sorted. So they, they literally can just mourn their loss. That's a privilege. There are so many of us who now have to think, where am I going to live? You know, um, they may have to take on extra work to support the family. They may have to now look after children that were not their responsibility or their sole responsibility before or parents who were not their sole responsibility there's so much in it it's not just grief and it's we cannot experience grief in isolation of life and so the the, the so there are so many layers to it that often we just suppress our feelings in order to just carry on in order to survive keep going and then years later we can find that it is as though we've had ticking time bombs in certain areas of our bodies that have eaten away at us from within and then something may happen that triggers it off and then bang before you know it you're sick where has this come from it's not necessarily the illness it may just be the grief that could maybe or should have or in an ideal world would have been dealt with back then. Sometimes the grief comes up to be dealt with. We don't know what it is. It manifests as sickness. We trot off to the doctors. We're given antidepressants or, or you know, tablets to maintain our physical health. And oftentimes all we actually needed was to talk about our grief. It's quite it's quite deep. There's so much to it. And often, you know, we can think, oh, it's just depression or it's just this. It's just that. It's not just. It's that plus grief is everything. Nor is it a medical condition. And yes. you know, I, I was very alarmed to discover, you know, a few years back that bereavement was now being, you know, in, in the psychiatry book as a mental disorder. Um, no, actually, <laughs> that yes. is a natural, normal response. Yes. yes. Death. This is not something that needs to be me medicalized yes. um, because it is not unnatural. It is not an illness. It is a normal response. Um, just thinking about what you were saying, you, you know, about the, the change in a life. Of course, the other thing that we are dealing with is not just the loss of the person, but very often people play a part mm. in our lives. They fulfill a role in yeah. our life. Yeah. You know, and it's and it it's still the case that, you know, um people rely on each other very closely to fulfill certain needs. Mm. And that when that when someone passes, there's now a vacancy, <laughs> a great big gaping hole. Yeah. That from a practical perspective, 
needs to be filled. Yeah. It's never going to be the same because that person is no longer there and nobody ever is going to be able to take their place yes. or do what they did exactly how they did it. Mm. That's why you miss them. Yeah. Because you know, they're, yeah. they're there. But it's, we still need to move things and get things done on a practical basis. So that's, I find that to be very hard um, because even when we're dealing with the loss of say parents who are not actively involved in helping us. Mm. And in fact, it's more the, the other way around that we're helping them. Yeah. There's, they still, there's still that, relationship apart from anything else you know there's still a parent yes and you're moving from being you know a, a child to an adult without a parent so yes. you're no longer someone's child obviously you're not a child anymore but you're no longer someone's child yes. I think that's quite a, a tough one isn't it when you realize that there's nobody who looks on you as their precious child. Um, or there's, a, you know, initially there's only one person now left. Yeah. And then there's nobody who looks at you and remembers what you were as a baby. Yeah. Yeah. That's hard. It is hard. I've, um, uh, decades now, I remember <laughs> it being said that you're not an adult until your parents die. I, I think I've come to that conclusion. I came to that conclusion about two years before losing my dad. And because it was the beginning, it, the, his process of dying, I think, took about two years, really. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I started to realize that he was going to pass. Yeah. And that meant that all of these things and then I thought oh that means his job is done that means I'm now the adult yeah I'm now a proper adult because the the older generation is dying yeah. and that's it that that leaves me that's it yeah. quite a, a very sobering thing isn't it it really I, I feel like there ought to be some rite of passage at this point, you know, because it's so huge. Yeah. And this too is a transition. You know, the our loved one passes away. That's the death transition. But in life, this is a leveling up for ourselves as well. This is a new way of being. This is a new identity. This is a new way, a new forward, a new life, you know, a fresh beginning that is foisted upon you. And so how do you move on without hearing those words, you know, when, you know, those little nicknames that they have for us or little things that they might sort of say, ah, oh, you done that when you was five. <laughs> no, don't, I don't want to hear it. Please tell me, I want to hear it. You know, now you go from not wanting it to oh, if only and so often grief starts as well before the transition has occurred because we mourn the life that should have been that we expect to always have we know that we will always pass away it's natural but we're not expecting it and so when it happens it's like everything it's everything Mm. yeah actually mourning the life that should have been that's yeah. the tough one the toughest one and that's when we're back to complicated grief again you know yeah, yeah. it it didn't have to be this way it shouldn't have been this way if yeah. only if only that and and so it goes on so this is um clearly a a, a wonderful um mission that you're on to help people through this this time yeah and you you do have a a book called uh tapestries of grief i do <clears throat> i do and um 
you, we have actually touched on so much in this conversation already that I have written about in the book, you know, and I too exclaim of my surprise when I found out that grief was a mental health issue. How does that work? You know, so I, there's so much that you've spoken of that I actually discuss in the book. The book is more of a definition of grief because we need to come to an awareness of what it is, the nature of it, and how in many ways it can actually serve as a gift for us. A gift that nobody wants, but it's a necessary gift that has to be worked through. We never come out the same after a loved one has passed away. And so when we don't know how to work with those emotions that come up, these natural emotions that are given, that are inside us, that are not to be suppressed, when we, when we know where we are in our grief, then I talk about overstanding as opposed to understanding. Because when you understand, you're, you're, you're working under somebody else's authority. When you overstand your grief, you guide your way forward. You are in control of it. And you recognize what your body is telling you. Grief is an energy and it can be transmuted into so many more positive ways. It's a lower energy, but it can be risen and changed and worked with. And so I will be putting a link to your book on the description box here. Um, and how do people get in touch with you, Laura? OK, so um, I'm on Facebook. I've got a Facebook group which is called Dipism. So Dipism is my business. And DIP, DIP, stands for death in practice. And ism is a way of life. So DIP ism. And where I get the ism from is when my cousin passed away in 2004. And I went and I told my father, Curtis has gone. And he said to me, Laura, death is part of life. Two months to the day, he himself was gone. He wasn't dying. He got meningitis and he passed away. So death is part of life and it's something that we have to recognize and respect. So I'll go back. <laughs> I have a group on Facebook, which is Dipism. So that's d.i.p.ism. You can find me there. The website is www dipism.com so again that's but that's just dipism.com and i'm also on instagram under d.i.p.ism as well so, Wonderful. Yeah. I'll, I'll be putting a link to your website um, on the description box as well mm. and um, thank you for your beautiful work and for your time today Thank you, Anna, for having me and allowing me to speak about my work. It really is a gift. And, you know, it's not morbid. Many people would think that this is such a morbid and miserable and dark work. It's so heartwarming. It really is. And it's um, the most important transition of our lives. So thank you for having me here to share it with you all. Well, what could be more important than working with people's hearts? <laughs> <laughs> thank you all for joining us today and um, i look forward to next time in which we will be discussing more wonderful aspects of life and spirit and soul until then goodbye